Uh, we have a very special event today uh, where we're bringing in experts who are going to comment on Russia's current situation in global affairs. It's a joint undertaking by the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and by the Carnegie, Coun Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Relations, which is a new undertaking and we hope will continue. Um, and we bring in different kinds of speakers and different, kinds of we, different perspectives. The purpose of today's event is to bring together people, not so much with different <coughs> opinions, although we have that too, I'm sure, but to bring together people who bring, in, uh, bring to bear different perspectives on the, the situation in Russia. And we find ourselves in a curious and complex situation, probably a sad one fundamentally, where we seem to recognize our Russia from years past. This could be that the stereotypes are informing our understanding of current events, or it could be that the current events are confirming the stereotypes. And here I think you'll see the difference of opinion. Um, we have in the first order, um, uh, we decided on the order would be um, Professor Nikolai Pet Petro, who is a, a professor of international, um, of comparative and international relations at the University of Rhode Island. He's not only a well-informed and well-trained mind, but he happened to be uh, on, the on the scene during the unfolding events of the past year as a Fulbright scholar, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Um, we have uh, Thomas Graham, who was a special assistant to President George W. Bush and on the National Security Council. Currently, he's with Kissinger Associates. And we have our own Arturis Rosenis, who is a, a professor of politics at New York University, um, who's interested in various large questions of democracy and democratization and participatory politics, but also has his own perspective on the region um, um, and on what it is to, in part, what it is to be a neighbor of, of, of Russia these days. Um, uh, again, we're looking for the, the, the diversity of, um, of, of perspectives as well as the diversity of opinions. Uh, jointly working with us today is David Speedy, who is a senior fellow at the Carnegie, Carnegie Council. He'd like to give us a few words before we move directly into 15 minutes for each of the speakers. Thank you, Yanni. I'll be very brief. Uh, as Yanni said, this is a collaboration that we welcome greatly at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International <coughs> Affairs here in New York. And um, I have been there for about six years as director of the program in U.S. Global Engagement. When we started that program, it began in the, actually the 08 presidential run-up, uh, campaign run-up, when all the candidates were talking about restoring America's moral authority, re-engaging with the world after eight years of, sorry Tom, the perceptions of the Bush administration, present company accepted of course. Um, we wanted to look at this carefully and see how this really played out in terms of uh, when, the, when President Obama was elected. And we, I'd worked on Russia for many years with a foundation here in New York, and I was determined to stay the course of Russia, um, qu quite simply because we, we, we felt and we still feel that Russia, the Russian-American relationship is one of the most, if not the most important relationships uh, uh, then and now. And it, <coughs> it, to that, for that reason, I'm sort of interested when I hear that other uh, think tanks and some foundations are, quote, getting back into Russia because of recent events. We never left uh, at the council, I'm glad to say, and I think the, the numbers here show that many people agree uh, that Russia and the relationship remain of great importance. I'm delighted, by the way, to see some council faces here, friends of the Carnegie Council, as well as, of course, our constituency here in, in New York. And finally, I'm delighted to welcome um, two old friends Nikolai Petro, uh, I, I, we did, he told me at lunch, seven interviews. I thought it was five, so I mean, uh, we, we, we did seven Lost interviews when, when Nikolai was in Odessa during the last, uh, the upheavals of the last year. And Tom Graham is also an old friend who has spoken at the council, uh, been a film that we produced about uh, post-Soviet Russia. Uh, I will embarrass him by saying that I think he's the, the, the last sort of... Uh, penetrating intellect to occupy the Russia desk at the National Security Council, and uh, I know you'll enjoy his, his uh, perspective. And of course, it's always good to meet a new friend also. So that's it. We will be doing a, a second half of this double header sometime in the spring. Stay tuned, both the NYU and the Carnegie Council uh, guests. And uh, Yanni, let us begin. Nikolai is our, our, our guest from, from, from afar. Would you like to begin? Sure. Uh, force of habit, so I will uh, use the lectern. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. I'd like to focus my remarks <clears throat> on Ukraine, where I spent most of the past year. And let me begin by saying that I 
Very much agree with Jack Matlock, our first ambassador to Russia, with Tony Brenton, Britain's former ambassador to Russia, Chris Westall, Canada's former ambassador to Russia and Ukraine, and former German chancellors Gerhard Schröder and Helmut Schmidt and Václav Klaus, former president of the Czech Republic, on this point. The conflict in Ukraine is a conflict among indigenous communities that have a very different idea of what it means to be Ukrainian. It is a war over Ukrainian identity. For the westernmost regions, Halichina, being Ukrainian means suppressing Russian culture so that Ukrainian culture can thrive in its stead. Here, creating Ukraine, a Ukraine that is antithetical to Russia, is commonly referred to as making a civilizational choice in favor of Europe. For the eight Russophone regions of eastern and southern Ukraine, which I sometimes call the other Ukraine, being Ukrainian means being a distinct nation that is still very close to Russia. These Ukrainians do not wish to join Russia, but neither do they wish to be forced to forsake Russian culture in order to be considered loyal Ukrainians. They do not accept the idea that there is any civilizational choice to be made, but if forced to choose between a Ukraine in NATO or the EU, or in alliance with Russia, they prefer Russia by a two-to-one margin. At its core, therefore, this is a conflict about whether Ukraine should be a monocultural or a pluricultural nation. And peace is unlikely until Ukrainian politics are brought into conformity with the country's cultural reality. Why did this conflict explode now? For more than two decades, these two regionally based versions of na national identity managed a tense coexistence, alternating the presidency between them and thwarting the functioning of parliament in order to prevent the other side from implementing its maximum political agenda. Gridlock prevented reform, it is true, but it was also Ukraine's way of avoiding civil war, which many believed would erupt if one side were to dominate completely and turn its definition of Ukrainian politics into a test of civic loyalty. This is what many Ukrainians believe happened on February 22nd, 2014. President Yanukovych's ouster was seen as a violation of the delicate political balance between Galicia and Donbass, and therefore a direct threat to the core interests of Russophone Ukrainians. Two-thirds of Donbass residents surveyed in early May said they regarded the Maidan as, quote, an armed overthrow of the government organized by the opposition with the assistance of the West, end quote. The same day, 3,000 local officials from eastern and southern Ukraine gathered in Kharkiv and voted to assume political control in their regions until constitutional order was restored in Kiev. In Crimea, the regional parliament went even further and sought to redress an old grievance the abrogation of its 1992 constitution by calling for a referendum on greater autonomy within Ukraine. Kiev responded by sacking the Ukrainian Minister of Defense and putting mi the military under direct command of the newly, new acting speaker slash president who tried to replace local military commanders and security forces in Crimea. Crimean authorities then requested the assistance of the Russian Black Sea Fleet stationed in Crimea Citing the threat to Russian citizens, military personnel, and compatriots in Crimea, Putin is given authority to use Russian troops in Ukraine. A week later, the Crimean referendum is moved up. The question changed from autonomy within Ukraine to secession with the intent of joining Russia, and the rest is history. The same scenario unfolds in Donbass. But there, Russia responds very differently. First, it distances itself from the rebels, and opposes their referendum for greater autonomy within Ukraine, which the rebels go ahead with anyway. Second, after holding military exercises in February, Russia announces the return of troops to their barracks in late April, after the beginning of Kiev's military campaign in the east. Finally, after Petro Poroshenko's election, and just as the Ukrainian military campaign in the east expands, Putin asks the Russian parliament to rescind his authority to use troops outside Russia. I therefore do not believe that Russia's strategy is to destabilize Ukraine. 
It is already coping with half a million refugees. More instability there will only produce economic collapse, a failed state, and millions of refugees. What it wants, I believe, is a stable Ukraine that will be able to repay the $30 billion it currently owes to Russia in private, corporate, and government debt. But it strongly disagrees with the West about how stability can be achieved. The West, I gather, is not in the least bit concerned with cultural differences in Ukraine and how they affect politics. It assumes that if corruption is reduced, the economy grows, cultural divisions then simply fade away. Russia, on the other hand, sees Ukraine as a culturally fragmented society. Corruption feeds on this fragmentation and leads to political gridlock. Peace and stability, therefore, require the legitimation of these cultural differences. This is a bit distinct from the point I made at the outset, that peace and stability depend on bringing Ukrainian politics into conformity with cultural reality. There are actually two ways to do this. The first is to forge a pluricultural Ukraine in which minorities community, minor, minority communities are given equal rights within the framework of Ukrainian political identity. This is the preferred Russophone and Russian solution. The second is to forge a culturally homogeneous Ukraine in which minorities are assigned a subordinate status and are politically powerless to change it. The pluricultural option has been rejected by President Poroshenko and by the majority of the newly elected Ukrainian parliament. But due to the events of this year, the monocultural option has gained a new lease on life. And the reasons are obvious. There are now six million fewer Russophone Ukrainians under Ukrainian government control. That is a 28% reduction of the Russophone population of Ukraine, not, in count, not counting refugees. Moreover, because the military conflict is so highly localized, compared to 2012, Russophone Ukraine has lost 43% of its GDP and 46% of its export capacity. The once dominant Russophone regions no longer have the wealth or political influence to sway national politics in their favor. The latest parliamentary elections demonstrate the new correlation of forces. The population loss in Donbass and Crimea combined with a 17% decrease in voter turnout in the rest of Russophone Ukraine and a 3% increase in voter turnout in the three Galician regions of the West resulted in 90% of the party list seats going to parties that advocate for Ukrainian cultural supremacy. Whether or not a monocultural Ukrainian polity succeeds will likely depend on how it treats its Russophone minority which in almost any scenario will still constitute at least a third of the population. Many prominent intellectuals have said that Russian speakers will need to be re-educated into a proper appreciation of their suppressed Ukrainian identity, a process that Donetsk University professor Yelena Stiashkina calls, quote, positive, peaceful colonization, end quote. To accomplish this, Kiev will have to impose a new political and economic elite in the region, just as the North did in the South after the American Civil War. Indeed, the Parliamentary Accords just signed on November 21st contain as one of its key provisions military redistricting in order to, quote, ensure a permanent military presence in the East, end quote. And just as it did in the American South, any institutionalized subordination of Russophone Ukraine is likely to spawn a subculture of, re of resentment against, quote, the occupiers and result in an illiberal democracy. <clears throat> Our present attitude toward Ukraine reminds me of the judgment of Solomon. Only instead of being like the mother who relinquishes her claim to save the child, the West and Russia are like the woman who, were, who would prefer to see the child torn asunder rather than let the other side have it. In reality, our interest in Ukraine is twofold. First, achieving a viable Ukraine. Second, removing it as a source of geostrategic contention. Currently, our policy fails on both counts. The best chance of saving Ukraine in its present borders <coughs> 
I believe, would be a reconstruction program beyond George C. Marshall's wildest dreams. A program of this magnitude would require pooling the resources of Russia, the EU, the United States, and other international organizations, and having them work together over many years. Sadly, such a program has no chance of being implemented, mainly because it would acknowledge the obvious, Russia's importance to preserving world order, which many now equate with rewarding Russia rather than with common sense. I suspect we will be paying for this lack of vision for the rest of this century. Two likely consequences spring to mind. The first is the demise of Ukraine as we now know it, as the country fragments into those very spheres of influence that political leaders claim to be so fervently against. The second consequence is what I call the great shift eastward, by which I mean Russia's embrace of her heretofore unused Asian patrimony. There is a long list of geostrategists who have warned the West to do everything possible to prevent this by binding Russian interests firmly to Europe. No doubt many of them recall Dmitry Mendeleev's famous saying that, quote, Siberia is destined to magnify Russia's power, end quote. On its present course, I fear that the West's enduring legacy in the 21st century may be to fulfill this destiny. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll turn next to Arturis Rosenas, who's our colleague here at NYU Politics. Would you like to sit or would you like to? Can you hear me from here if I talk like that? You do? Okay. Uh, hi. Thank you for inviting me to this interesting talk. So I should proceed by saying that I am not really a specialist of Russia, nor I am a specialist of international relations. And yet I'm here, so I guess I will do my best to make, to make a comment on this very difficult, for me very, very difficult and interesting, interesting case. It is difficult for me as a cultural Russophile to talk about the political situation that is not just an intellectual endeavor, but something that very intimately and individually relates to, to the survival of, uh, of my state and my, and my families. I happen to be uh, the, the resident of one of the Baltic states, and so we're experiencing these things, again, not as something just an intellectual proposition, but as, a, as, a, as an, as an ex existentially interesting situation. So uh, I want to talk about three things. I want to make sort of three, three types of statements here. First, I want to talk briefly about uh, what I believe is the condition or the situation of the Russian state uh, on the international arena. Second, I want to talk about the political position of Putin in the current state of affairs that is separate the, the position of the leadership inside Russia versus the position of the Russia in the context of international affairs. And lastly, I would like to talk very briefly what I believe should be, or in some ways is already happening, the response of the West uh, to the conditions that we see evolving on the ground. So where is the Russia standing right now? And I, I should proceed again by saying that I find the, the, uh, saying these things for me is very, very difficult, again, as a Russian, uh, as a, as a Russophile, but the, these things have to be said. So in some ways, uh, the best testimony to what is actually the situation of Russian international affairs is what we saw uh, these two events that we saw in Australia in the G20 meeting, right? So we saw this very uncomfortable picture of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, uh, eating his lunch by himself at the table and a second, uh, second moment when he was passing the President Obama in the conference room and he sort of tapped him uh, in a flirting manner on the, sho on the shoulder and Obama was completely and deliberately oblivious to that, to that flirt. Okay, so we sort of, if you go to meet 19 most powerful leaders of the world and the only thing that shows you affection is a koala beer, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> that has to be said, right? You're not, you're, you're not doing something right. It cannot be the case that all of these 19 leaders suddenly in some big conspiracy agree to hate or to dislike or to disrespect Russia for no good reason. So there's, there is some reason, right? And so I think that's sort of the situation of Russia that unfortunately, I'm, again, I'm saying very unfortunate that we have right now, that it's a country that desperately wants to be respected, but it's not respected. It's feared by some, okay? So it's feared by its neighbors, like us, for example. It's feared directly because we fear eventual military intervention. This is, again, not, not, not an intellectual proposition, but the actual hypothesis. 
And then it's feared by neighbors who cannot be directly invaded, but who fear instability <coughs> that is already caused by the first land grab in the post-war Europe. So this is the situation that, uh, that, that we have right now. Sort of uh, the best metaphor to describe Russia is you have a bully in a high school, and he's, that bully is eating alone in a cafeteria, and so some people fear of him, some people, uh, some people do not fear of him, but no, no one really respects him. And I think, again, this situation is extremely, extremely unfortunate. So where is Russia standing right now is the result of this. So we have a currency that has fallen by 30%. We had an unprecedented flight of the capital. Okay, we have economic stagnation, almost economic stagnation. The last forecast is 1% of growth. I think it is over, overestimated. We have political and economic isolation that you cannot deny. And I think the most troublesome aspect of that, that you have unprecedented flight of human capital. Okay, so the, the, the statement that was made by the CEO of Sberbank is that today the most popular application among business in Russia is not the one to set up a new company, to open a register an enterprise, but an application to leave to receive a residence permit. So we speak right now, the, the whole class of, the whole creative class of Russia in large numbers is, is, is leaving as we speak. A lot of them actually are moving to, to the Baltic states to our advantage and establishing quite successful IT, IT companies. So that, that part is really good. And now if we talk about who is, who is in line with Russia? Okay, so you have to ask yourself a question. Okay, if I'm doing something and then I have a pushback in the way Russia is, Russia, the Russia is getting right now, am I really doing something wrong? In order to answer your question, you have to ask yourself, who is on my side? So if we look at the countries that are really on the side of Russia, the countries, for example, that voted in the UN to approve the, the Crimean, uh, the, sorry, against the Crimean uh, annexation, it's Cuba, Syria, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Okay, so this is a very interesting crowd because so Cuba owns most of its debt to Russia that, as of July, Putin said we, they're going to redeem most of it, okay? So Syria buys most of its arms from Russia. So 10%, I read the number somewhere, I believe it's credible, that about 1-10% of global arms sales of Russia goes to Syria, okay? Because no one else is, well, Chinese are selling a bit, but, you know, very few countries are selling guns to, guns to Syria, so Syria must like Russia for that regard. And then, of course, there is the, the, the whole relationship that Russia started building with Venezuela already a while ago. So you have this set of countries that are not really are going in Russia because they agree with it on some ideological dimension. So we have a different situation from the Soviet Union where we, ha we have some sort of international ideological alliances on some sort of level of uh, human ideas. People were following the leadership of, of the Soviet Union. We don't have any of that right now. The alliances that Russia built are very costly alliances. So these are very few countries that Russia got on its side at a very high cost. If it's a tenable situation, I really doubt it. So I believe this is a very unfortunate, unfortunate situation for the Russia as a state. Now, I would like to distinguish it from the situation of Vladimir Putin as a, as a leader of a country, which is a quite different question, whether the situation he's, he's in right now makes the regime, the Putinist regime itself, stronger or weaker. And I think it's a very, very interesting juncture because what we had so far from the year 2000 up until 2014, essentially, is we had what I would call dictatorial welfare state. Okay, you had a, a country that had, had about 50% of its budget built on oil revenues, 25% of GDP built on oil revenues, st stabilized the payouts to the civil servants, to the, civil, civil, uh, to the state owned enterprise sector, made the economy more stable, and then the support of Putin, and this has been shown by multiple articles and multiple research papers in political science, that the support of Putin was always going hand in hand with economic performance. Economy is going down, Putin's support is going down. Economy is going up, Putin's support is going up, except one episode, which was Georgia in 2008. Okay, for a brief period of time, despite the economy was going down, his approval ratings were going up because of the rally behind the flag effect. Now, at that time, of course, you had an economic crisis, and Russia had a big reserve of money to sort of to serve as a cushion against the, against the unexpected global shock. I think now we have a far bigger shock to Russia's economy, and the coffins are far emptier than they were at that time. And so we are in a very, very interesting situation where you have the following constellation of forces. On the one hand, you have big rally behind the flag effect. The support of Putin is now driven to a large extent by the successful annexation of Crimea and by what is going on in Ukraine. What that means is that his support basis is now really shifting from the actual population, from the wide support in the population, which was in many, in many ways subsidized and bought directly through, 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 through the oil money, to the successfulness of the military operations. What does that mean? That means that this area, the military, Putin's position actually became weaker than it was before. His actual survival as the head of the state is now 
as dependent on the secret services and as dependent on the military apparatus as it never was before. Now, this wouldn't be bad in and of itself, but we know from political science <coughs> research, from multiple research papers, that this is actually, these are the conditions under which dictators are actually most susceptible to experience coup d'etat, most susceptible to experience revolutions. Okay? And now when you couple it with the second fact that oil prices are going down, economy is going down, and now you have to make a choice. Will I pay salaries? Will I increase salaries for teachers, for doctors? Or will I actually increase salaries for the military men? Okay, so now we already saw yesterday the first protest in Moscow and some other places of Russia where doctors came out to protest uh, the, the cuts in the, in the health spending with the slogans, save on war, not on health. Okay, so we have this position now where the previous support base, which was basically sort of working middle class Russians that liked the economic stability and rising economic expectations and wages, their support is now going to be to a large degree withdrawn because simply the money is running out and wherever money you have, you will have to pay more for the military in order for the military to stay on your side. So I think his, his political position is really difficult and I think that now we, are, we will be seeing sort of the transition from what I would call subsidized cons uh, consent state, sort of the, 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 the dictatorial welfare state that we had before, to the actual dictatorial state where you rely more on repression than on subsidies. Because, you will, again, you will have to divert more resources to the repressive apparatus, secret services and the military, as opposed to the, the public spending. And I think what exactly, the, how exactly that dynamic is going to play out is, is, is really interesting. It's really interesting, for example, what, people, what are the political ambitions of people like the defense, defense ministry, you know, Igor Shoigu. Does he have big political ambitions? I would presume as all men of that, of that yeah. range they do. And what, this really puts him in a very strong position against uh, Putin as, as, I, as I currently see it. And now let me sort of uh, talk very briefly about what I believe could be or should be, and in some ways it's already automatically becoming a response of the West to the, to the situation. So what I find very, very troubling in, in the conversations about Russia is that we have these, in America too, in Europe especially, we have these two very diametrically opposed discourses, paradigms of how we talk about the crisis. So the first one, I would call it sort of the might makes right paradigm, is sort of supported by uh, in, in, uh, non-repressed intellectuals in Russia, and very interestingly, a lot of sort of old school right wing uh, policy intellectuals in the United States. The idea being, well, the whole thing that happened in Ukraine is a provocation by the West. You should have realistically predicted the Russia's response to whatever you did in helping the Maidan revolution to succeed. And therefore, that should have deterred you from making these steps. Okay, so that's, that's the idea sort of that the first land grab in the post-war Europe we experienced was a big error miscalculation on the part of both Ukraine and the West. So I find this argument very strange because it is neither morally or legally appealing, nor is it a very pragmatic argument. What exactly are we achieving? We are essentially making a defeatist position that no one should have changed the status quo, political status quo in any of the domestic countries in fear that it can serve against the interest of Russia and then therefore should incentivize the Russia to take the action that, uh, that it actually did. So I find this argument just on a practical level very unappealing. It simply justifies the position of Russia and unjustifies any of the political action that you could take actually to change the political situation in, domestically as if sort of, you know, under this argument the American Revolution Independence War should, shouldn't have happened. You know, the founding fathers should have calculated the military response of the British crown because it was against the, the British interest for, 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 for the colonists to secede. So it's a sort of, so, sort of similar interesting, interesting uh, intellectual position that, again, I do not find very pragmatically useful. And then we have this also very strange position, which was in the beginning supported almost directly word by word by American administration, I mean the president, with words like these actions like that do not have a role in the 21st century and sort of the idea is that if we shame Russia enough it will change its course of action okay so the idea being well you signed the agreement in 1994 to defend the territorial territorial integrity of, of Ukraine in return for them giving away nuclear weapons and now one of the parties of the agreement decides that well we don't care what we agreed upon. Whether it is a memorandum or treaty, that's a different, different notion. Russia did make that agreement. 
And so the argument there being, well, you just shouldn't breach your agreements. And I think, again, this is a very, very weak proposition to argue against Russia because as with many states that are sort of new and young, it's, uh, the value of this argument relies only to the degree that the country has an incentive or reputation to uphold its agreements. The countries that are sort of pretty young, they have very low incentive to, 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 uh, to follow these kinds of uh, uh, allegations. And I don't think it's a very useful argument in the sense that talk is very cheap. So whatever, wherever, wherever Russia agrees on a formal basis, we shouldn't take it as if with any other country, we shouldn't take it for granted just because it made that statement. Talk is cheap, so actions, actions are really expensive. That's what we should focus on. So what I believe is, is already happening as a response to this, uh, to this uh, intervention is that, well, we should flip the argument that Russia and some people on the right in America is, is making. We should flip, flip it on its head. We should say, well, it's, it's Russia's fault that it actually provoked the reaction that we see right now, which is, Sweden and Finland are already thinking about joining NATO, which they didn't do before, okay? Now NATO obviously has much, is making much, much, much bigger steps in terms of uh, uh, allowing the Ukraine to enter. Of course, there's a big legal issue here. How you, how you can have a country part of NATO which doesn't have its territorial integrity in order? So I think it's a big legal argument, but that's for lawyers to decide. So in other words, I think we should be pretty straightforward and, and pushy with this argument that, well, look, if you do the land grab on the scale that you did, you're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to pay for it. And I think Russia, in some ways, in, in many ways, is already paying in terms of the security loss and economic loss that, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that it is uh, experiencing. So I think that even if, if the end game of this, of this whole process, is not going to be the membership of Ukraine as, as we see it right now in NATO, that sort of what will be enough is a highly publicized, transparent process, which would create a big and uh, visible opportunity for Ukraine to, to join NATO eventually. I think that would really weaken the, the, the position of, the, uh, of both Putin and of the military uh, uh, complex in Russia that is behind, the, uh, behind these, uh, these, uh, these events that we see right now. So I, I, I think that we should not be ashamed and we should be forceful with, uh, with this argument that it is in the interest of the West to respond to this escalation as strong as it can. Thank you very much. Uh, two strong opinions so far, and now we'll come to the third. Uh, Tom Graham. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, putting on this panel discussion today. It's, uh, it's clearly a, a topic that deserves a lot of attention, and I presume will continue to get a lot of attention over the next over the next several months. Uh, it's always uncomfortable for a former government official uh, to speak on a panel with two people who are experts and actually know what they're talking about. Um, in the government, we tend to speak at the, the level of 30 to 40,000 feet uh, above the range of book systems, I would, uh, I would note. Um, but uh, in addition, we have the saving grace that we're trained to be short. Um, so, uh, what I want to do is share a, a few thoughts with you, a few ideas, a few impressions about uh, sort of the situation with Russia with regard to Ukraine and Russia's standing in the world. Now, if you had asked me six months ago uh, were the outlines of a resolution of the Ukraine crisis visible, I would have said yes and emphatically. Uh, I think then uh, we would have said that what you need in order to bring this crisis to a resolution uh, is some form of decentralization uh, of power uh, in the Ukrainian state. You can call it federalization, autonomy, whatever you want, but some form of decentralization. Some assurances for the rights of Russian, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers, not only in eastern and, uh, and southern Ukraine, but throughout uh, Ukraine. Uh, some form of, and pick your term, non-bloc status, non-alignment, neutrality uh, that took Ukraine uh, out of geopolitical competition between, between Russia, Europe, uh, and the United States. Uh, and then some agreement on a, a large economic package uh, that would, because of the situation in Ukraine, have to include the United States, Russia, and the European Union in a long-term process of helping to rebuild the Ukrainian uh, economy. Now, all the elements of a solution like that have, in fact, been on offer for the past several months. 
Uh, Poroshenko has talked about this. Western European leaders have talked about this. I mean, even the United States in its own uh, peculiar way has acknowledged that some of these things uh, need to happen. Uh, Moscow has continued to talk about it, but I think what we find frustrating when you look at this from the, uh, the, the capitals in Europe uh, and in Washington, D.C., is, is that Moscow appears unwilling to, to seriously negotiate the, the details uh, of a resolution uh, of this crisis, these very details that it laid out, I think, at the, at the beginning back in February and March uh, of this year. And so I, a question arises in my mind as to what Moscow's real goals are in Ukraine. What are its motives? What are its interests? Have those changed uh, as the crisis itself has unfolded uh, over, the past, uh, over the past six months? Are they larger or smaller than they were when we began? How are we going to begin to uh, uh, carry out a successful negotiation? Now, this is also complicated by the fact uh, that Moscow refuses to acknowledge that it's a real party to the conflict. Uh, it likes to say that this is a problem internal to Ukraine, uh, whereas I think most of us in the West would agree that Russia itself is a player inside Ukraine, that it's a party to the, the conflict, and at some point it is going to have to sit down with the Ukrainian authorities, whoever those might be, to negotiate, negotiate the details. Obviously the European Union, the United States are also going to be in, are also interested parties that have to take uh, part in the negotiation, but at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be the Ukrainians themselves along with the Russians that are going to have to sort this out if there's going to be a sustainable uh, long-term solution. Now, all of this is complicated uh, in the near term by the sanctions, um, the sanctions war that has uh, accelerated over the past, over the past several months. Uh, Moscow, I think it is clear now, wants the sanctions lifted in some way. Uh, and they've made uh, a lot of public statements to that regard. The West, on the other hand, wants Moscow to change its behavior first before it even considers uh, lifting sanctions. And so we have this problem of the fact that despite all the parties to the conflict do see this as moving into a, uh, a situation that is going to be more harmful to their interest, uh, neither side is prepared to take the first step in de-escalating this, uh, this crisis. That, I think, is in part a consequence, and this would be my second point, of the fundamental breakdown in trust uh, between Russia, Europe, uh, Russia on the one hand, Europe and the United States, uh, on the other hand, magnified by the, uh, by the conflict in Ukraine over the, past, over the past several months. Now, many people have spoken of a return to the Cold War. Um, I come out that this is not a return to the Cold War. There are a lot of uh, fundamental differences uh, uh, between now and what happened uh, in the, the 40 years after the, uh, after the end of the Second World War. But in some ways, the situation is in fact more dangerous than it was during the Cold War. And I would put it this way. If you think back 30 to 35 years, uh, no one disputed the fact that there were Soviet troops in Afghanistan. Nobody disputed the fact that the United States was was aiding the Mujahideen. Uh, what we differed on in Moscow and Washington was how you interpreted those facts and how we saw events unfolding. The problem today is we can't even agree on what some of the basic facts are and what's happening on the ground uh, in Ukraine. Uh, are the Russian troops uh, on the ground in Ukraine? Moscow says no, the West says yes. Uh, and we have no sort of reliable way of overcoming those differences, agreeing on what the facts are, and then uh, turning the, uh, the conversation and the discussion into how we interpret those facts and what are the ways uh, to move the process forward. I, it's complicated uh, by the fact that at least one of the parties is not interested in the truth uh, of what's happening on the ground. We can argue over which side that is, but at least one is not interested in the truth of what's happening on, uh, on the ground. And I would suggest that both sides, to a certain extent, uh, don't want to face up to the reality of what they in fact know is happening on the ground because it complicates the position that they want to take uh, publicly uh, and, and with their allies and in front of the, uh, the rest of the world. Now, we're never going to be able to uh, overcome this basic uh, disagreement over the facts because we don't talk to one another each uh, any longer. That's certainly true uh, of the U.S.-Russian relationship. And what's interesting about this uh, is that both sides suggest it's the other side that doesn't want to talk. 
uh, and each side in fact puts pressures on, on individuals, government officials, experts not to talk to the other side as a, a way of trying to think through this crisis, to come to some common uh, understanding of what's happening on the ground uh, and to work through the various alternatives uh, for resolving this. So we have a breakdown in communication and I think we have a situation in which Russia is isolated in Europe uh, at a minimum. Uh, and Russia has made an effort over the past several months to break that isolation, building on the support uh, or in support of anti-EU forces uh, throughout Europe. We saw that during the, uh, uh, the parliamentary campaign in Europe. And the interesting thing about this is for Moscow, it doesn't make any difference where they, whether the anti-EU forces are on the right wing or the left wing as long as they're anti-EU. Uh, they're welcome in Moscow and welcome as a force that works uh, in Moscow's favor in the European situation. They've had some success, but I think the isolation, at least as far as government circles, is, is growing. And you look at some of the recent comments from German Chancellor Merkel uh, about Russia and her frustration in dealing uh, with President Putin, and you begin to get a sense uh, of the depth of the lack of trust uh, and the rethinking of the relationship with Russia. Now, for the, uh, the third and final point, uh, even if you can isolate Russia in Europe, it's clear you can't isolate Russia internationally. It's simply too large and important economy. One of the top 10 economies in the world, an economy that provides a lot of oil and gas uh, and other natural resources that are critical to the functioning of the global economy, uh, critical to the functioning of the economy, uh, economy in a lot of, uh, of large states. And Moscow has clearly reached out uh, to non-European countries, particularly the BRICS, uh, in an effort to build alternative institutions, uh, to help, uh, seeking help in restructuring the international order that's dominated by the West on both the security side uh, on, a, on the economic side. And clearly there have been some success. The BRICS have taken a number of steps to build uh, institutions that will act as alternatives, as substitutes uh, to the IMF and the World Bank. In their nation stages, uh, but they have the potential to grow. Uh, you see a greater effort by Russia and some of its BRIC par partners to clear uh, their bilateral trade in, in local currencies, an effort to undermine the role of, of the dollar as uh, the international uh, reserve currency. All of this, I think, uh, uh, helps uh, break down Russia's isolation. I think it raises questions for the future uh, of the international system that the West needs to focus on to a greater extent than it has so far. But at the end of the day, I think it has done uh, very little to bolster Russia's position. I think if you look closely at the, the attitudes, uh, you can see that the BRICS, while they may not have voted for the resolution at the UN uh, condemning the annexation of the Crimea, uh, did abstain. And in the private conversations, very few are willing to admit that they think that this is a, uh, is a good precedent for, for global affairs, particularly the Chinese. The Chinese, uh, by the same token, are more than happy to take uh, advantage of a weakened Russia uh, in order to cut a, uh, a lot of very advantageous deals, certainly for gas, uh, but I think also for other natural resources in Siberia uh, and the Russian Far East, and more broadly, uh, throughout Russia. I mean, one of the things people will tell you is that there are more Chinese running around Moscow now talking with various ministers, various ministries trying to cut deals uh, at a time of weakness uh, when Russia, I believe, is on the defensive. Uh, if you look at India, uh, India uh, doesn't want to destroy its relationship with Russia, but when it looks at its geopolitical problems, clearly the United States uh, is much greater interest as a potential counter to what they see as this long-term strategic competition with China uh, than Russia is going to be. And then the final point I would make on this, what's interesting when you talk to Indian officials and Chinese officials, that in many ways they share the Western assessment of the difficulties that the Russian economy faces, the difficulties that the Russian state faces, uh, and all of them believe that it's a country that's in decline. Uh, they don't believe it's going to pass away uh, off, the, off the stage in the near term. They are certainly more than happy to use Russia as a foil in building their own relations with the West, but they don't see Russia as a long-term strategic partner. Uh, and in their own minds, uh, Russia is going to slowly fade into, 
irrelevancy. Now, uh, we can argue about that. I think that's a debatable point. Uh, but what I would stress is that while Russia might not be isolated in global affairs, uh, the point is that uh, more of the big emerging economies see it as not a long-term factor, but a short-term factor. And that, in some ways, uh, is, for Russia, uh, is worse than being isolated. Thank you very much. So we've had three, I think, very intelligent perspectives, and I, and I stress that what's at, what's at issue here is not so much the, um, the facts. Or I don't think the panelists would necessarily degree, disagree about the facts, but in terms of how they're interpreted and what perspective they're taking. Uh, these are three global perspectives, actually, which is, I think, the way to go when we're, we're trying to understand any country, including Russia. So at this point, uh, the speakers are free to ask each other questions and to pick, on point, pick up on points uh, that, that struck them. And we can also turn to the audience uh, for questions or comments. Would you like to speak to each other? <laughs> can, 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 I, can I ask a polite question? Yes. Can I? So to what extent do you, do you so I, I totally agree with your description of, of the, the cultural tensions and conflicts in present-day Russia. But the way you described it, it seems to me that that sort of happened in its own right without any direct interference or construction of that conflict from the, from the side of Russia. Right? I mean, these, they were living peace, peace, peacefully for, the, you know, for 25 years since the breakdown of the Soviet Union, but didn't have visible salient cultural conflicts happening. Now, so it is coming at this very interesting historical juncture, and I don't believe it is completely independent from what the Eastern Ukrainians, for example, see on Russian media, how the whole conflict is being framed over there. So I don't see it as being completely independent of Russia's own, own behavior, the, the situation that you're describing. Would you agree with that? <coughs> yes, I agree that global media is interconnected and influences events in Ukraine. But I would disagree with the notion that Ukrainian society was at peace from 19... Uh, 91 to the present. And if you look at any electoral map since 1994, what do you see? You see one color on the left outside of the Dnieper and another color on the right. And uh, I remember a lot of discussions I've had with people in Ukraine, <coughs> including former presidents of Ukraine, <laughs> who have said this was something we didn't manage to pay attention to in time. And really, I don't think anyone is really surprised at this outcome. It was destined to happen. Unless you were going to really treat the Russophone Ukrainians and allow them the right that they don't have in the Ukrainian constitution, which is to fully be Ukrainians with Russian, uh, as representatives of Russian culture, because there is only one official language in Ukraine. And that point is, is reiterated and being reaffirmed now. Um, so, would, would it be fair to push that point further and to say that insofar as there has been a Russian involvement in Ukraine, it's in defense of these local you know, cultural Russian interests in Ukraine? Is, is, is that part of what you're... It's partly that, but I think that, is, that interpretation alone is largely public relations. In other words, I think Russia is defending Russia's interests in Ukraine, in Europe, in China, in, uh, as best it can, and as it defines them. The problem I see with our relationship is that we don't care how Russia defines its interests. We have our interests, and their interests are irrelevant to us. That's always going to lead to problems. I'll, I'll come to you with one of these. Yeah. Our first speaker um, indicated uh, the, uh, that he sees Putin as having uh, made efforts not to egregiously exploit that situation in the Ukraine, that his primary objective is uh, sort of peace and quiet and an avoidance of a massive refugee problem and so on. An alternative view would be that Putin is the protagonist, that all the problems in Crimea was manufactured rather than genuine, that Putin really does fear uh, encroachment by NATO into Ukraine, however irresponsibly that may have been suggested, uh, and that the Russian people 
uh, have supported him with such great enthusiasm that it motivates him further. Just wonder if you would comment on that, that view. Um, <coughs> I uh, <coughs> believe that um, the situation that developed in Crimea had a long-standing history. We should not forget uh, that Crimea declared its autonomy and independence from the USSR before Ukraine did. It was later reinfolded into the Ukraine when Ukraine declared its independence, but as soon as it did that, it initiated work on its own constitution. This is a serious domestic issue. Uh, Crimean autonomy was a serious domestic issue. There were going to be people speculated about the possibility of Russian intervention, civil war in 1994, 1995, when Crimea had its own president, pres uh, president uh, Yuri Meshkov. This is not new. This is all history, and it exists. And people did not forget. And when the opportunity arose, now this, it was taken advantage of, I uh, very much think, by local politicians and by Moscow and by a lot of forces. But for those who say, well, uh, let's just look at the Crimean issue from the perspective of international law and say that it's an annexation, I have just one question. What do we do with the people? What do we do with the people who live there? Because over 20 years, and f perhaps even further back beyond, but we have, we have surveys for 20 years which suggest that only very recently was there even a slight majority that recognized the desirability of staying in Ukraine. Then the events of February happened. They declared, each of the two parliaments declared each other mutually illegitimate, and of course, uh, this situation led to a remembrance of all those past uh, hostilities between Kiev and Crimea. So this did not come out of the blue. This has a long history, and uh, it will not go away. Even if some magically you could return Crimea to Ukraine, it would just start all the tensions over again. Can I add something uh, uh, on this question at this point? Uh, first point I would make is that I think certainly the Russians have seen whatever they've done uh, in Ukraine over the past six months as largely defensive. Uh, I think the concern was uh, the West penetration into Ukraine in, in a significant way. Um, I think the association agreement that was being negotiated uh, may have been a, a pretext, but it was reflected a larger concern uh, in Moscow that the West was actively trying to tear uh, Ukraine away from Russia. Uh, it countered, I think, uh, Putin's own ambitions of building a, a Eurasian Union uh, that he sees important to Russia's own uh, long-term uh, survivability as a major center of power. Uh, in, in, the, in the 21st century, and something that he saw as a natural process, uh, given the way integration has worked elsewhere in the world uh, uh, on an economic, uh, in the realm of economics. Uh, on Crimea, uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of, and we've seen this certainly uh, in Washington and elsewhere, outrage over what the Russians uh, did in, uh, uh, in March of this year. I think mean, Nikolai is absolutely right about the history uh, of, of Crimea, the tensions that were there, that this was a problem waiting to happen. Uh, but the point that I would make uh, is it's my impression from the conversations that I've had uh, that most American or, or most serious officials on this are prepared to concede Crimea, but it has to be done in a way uh, that is seen as consistent with some sort of rules and regulations. Uh, to run an, uh, a referendum where the question itself uh, is varied within two weeks, uh, where it is not thoroughly debated, uh, where it's difficult to put up uh, appropriate uh, electoral, the, the, uh, the roles of, uh, of people who have the right to vote, to conduct this in a proper fashion, uh, leaves everyone questioning uh, the legitimacy of it. 
That said, you look at the basic demographics, the history of Crimea, and you can see where even in a properly conducted referendum, uh, the vote probably would have been for at least independence, if not uh, uh, entry into the Russian Federation. Uh, so the question is that at this point is how do you square the circle of Crimea? Uh, how um, do you, in a sense, come up with a process uh, that will put that uh, question behind this uh, and that will be seen as a legitimate expression of the will of, of the people of Ukraine, Ukraine in Moscow, Kiev, the key European capitals in Washington. Uh, I think there are ways of doing that, uh, but I think you have to have a serious dialogue. You have to be talking to one another uh, to work your way out of that box, and we're not. Yeah, well, Tell me, if I could follow up on that, what would it take for that to happen? <laughs> Even, I mean, you have experience in diplomacy, you have experience in national security. You've probably seen impasses like this before. Um, <laughs> Not this bad. I, I, I've seen impasses for the past 20 years in U.S.-Russian yeah. relations. Uh, I mean, the only thing I say in, in self-defense is it's worse now than it was when I left. Um, so I'm not the only person to have gotten it wrong. Uh, look, I mean, I think you can't solve Crimea on its own is the point I would make. It's got to be part of a, uh, of a, of a broader solution to the, uh, to the Ukraine crisis. Uh, sort of the elements that I've talked of uh, before certainly can be negotiated. Uh, and I think if you can have, certainly in a private uh, dialogue with the Russians, some discussions of how you would deal with this issue. Uh, you know, my guess is at the end of the day uh, that even the authorities in Kiev realize that having Crimea in Ukraine is not necessarily a big benefit uh, to Ukraine. So there's room for negotiation, but it has to be part of a... Uh, a uh, a larger solution. And the final point I would make in here, and one of the things that I find disturbing, again, in the rhetoric that we hear out of uh, Washington and Brussels, we're always looking for an exit ramp for the Russians. Um, we need an exit ramp, too. Uh, everybody has to find a way to de-escalate, and that means nobody gets uh, the, uh, all their uh, interests satisfied fully. Uh, what you end up with, and I think my boss has said this, uh, is a balance of um, uh, a balance of, of damages to your own interests. Some sort of each side makes concession. You never get the full cake, but you get something that is reasonable uh, that allows everybody to s sustain this over time. If the parties are not reasonably satisfied, no solution is going to be lasting. Thanks uh, for a fascinating discussion from all three panelists. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, the first, I want to respond uh, just to Nikolai to the point about what about the people in Crimea. I, I'm struck by this large discussion of Ukraine and very little discussion about the Maidan and the motivation of the people in Maidan. To me, the seminal moment in all of this was the day that we saw people walking through Yanukovych's palace and we saw these viral images going forward of all the sort of wealth and accumulation that had come there, the fleet of cars, the ship, the gold-plated toilets, and all these sorts of things. So I think there's a double-edged issue here about what about the people, which goes to the heart of what our Taurus was saying in the beginning, right? <laughs> when you have people in this country who are, there, there's, there's geopolitical strategy going on, which is the subject of this panel, but there is also a long-running uh, story in Ukraine that goes back to the Orange Revolution about citizens of Ukraine trying to get out mm. of a corruption trap and trying different ways to get out of a corruption trap. And I'm you know, phenomenally struck by, the, by that day and by the peacefulness with which people walk through there and the speed at which those images circulated. Um, Tom, going to your point about uh, you know, that this is motivated, the beginning of this is motivated by Russia's fear of pushing, of Ukraine drifting out of its orbit into the West. The part of this that I've never understood that is always the humongous puzzle to me is that if we look back to where Russia was in February of 2014, at the end of the Sochi Olympics, it's standing in the world, and its situation vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Ukraine, which, as has been said by multiple panelists, has waffled back and forth on a razor's edge between unpopular governments that were more pro-Western and more pro-Russian, but always managing to throw their governments out of power and getting somebody else back in power. It's hard to imagine a course of events where Russia could have done more to push Ukraine firmly into a pro-Western camp for all of eternity going forward, right? You've stripped out the most reliably pro-Russian electorate of the country and a large enough electorate that is going to have a sizable effect on any future presidential election. You flip-flopped a lot of people in the middle of the country who had 
you know, mixed feelings about this West versus Russia, but had been reliable voters for regions, for the region, party of regions in the past. You flipped more people. Everything, every time we've looked at these maps, and we've seen a bazillion of these maps showing every map, the map is now very different now when you look at the vote across the country. And yes, there are turnout issues that have affected this, and we may see that map reverberating a little bit more to the mean in the past. You have West, the West showing much more interest in providing financial and military support to Ukraine than they ever would have had in, a, in alternative cases. So the question that I push to you, to push you, and I push this back to Nikolai too, because I think this really follows from your remarks as well, or any of you I'd like to be interested in hearing, if the goal was to keep Ukraine out of the orbit of the West, and the result has to push Ukraine farther and farther into the orbit of the West than ever before, is it possible that we have Putin's motivations wrong, right? I understand there are demographic numbers in Crimea, and I understand that a free and fair referendum in Crimea at multiple times in the past years might have led to the vote outcome of Crimeans choosing to join Russia. But surely this vote would not have taken place without the support of the Russians for the vote to take place. So the question is, if this has pushed Ukraine so far into the orbit of the West, what was Putin's motivation in the first place? Why to undertake these actions? Was this a story of international security concerns, as we've been talking about now, or was this a story more about Russian domestic politics? Nicholas, well, please. you've said um, <clears throat> the one answer that often comes up uh, answer this question is miscalculation, simple miscalculation. Um, but the other uh, plausible explanation is that this was actually not done through Putin's initiative, but is actually uh, as a result of his taking a more passive stance, a reaction to events that were thought through and directed uh, by the forces on the Maidan. The Maidan is actually not, it's not an institutionalized political force. It's an amorphous social movement of which groups have a certain influence in, among the constituents in the political process. But if you remember the situation in February and March, we actually had a split in political authority between the Maidan and the parliament. And it was not clear which of, whether they would agree, whether one side would overtake the other. And this, this lingering uncertainty about wh in which institution in Ukrainian society actual political legitimacy lies remains today. Because there are perpetual voices claiming to speak for the Maidan, claiming to speak for the people, claiming to speak for uh, the military forces uh, in the East and you know, now uh, as members of parliament going to uh, argue for a renewal of the military campaign for the unity of, of Ukraine. So I think those are all uh, difficulties that, that Ukraine uh, has to resolve. Broadly speaking, however, if I may step back, I think uh, that there is room for a discourse between East and West on Ukraine. And I think it goes uh, at its heart to addressing the issue of what went wrong and when it began to go wrong. In other words, where does fault, where does the, where, where does fault lie and when did that fault begin? Uh, the Western narrative on this is very different from the Russian narrative, but they're only a few weeks apart. And uh, the, the Western narrative is everything started to go wrong when Russia endorsed a <coughs> referendum in Crimea. That was the great turning point in our relationship from which we must deduce, uh, we, we must make conclusions. But for Russia, it occurred February 21st. That is to say, the tearing up within 24 hours of the ratification, the transition of power agreement that was signed in the presence of three uh, European foreign ministers and uh, the representative of the uh, Russian president. Um, the fact that that was very quickly swept under the rug is the greatest uh, sort of calamity uh, and indicates 
to, I think, Russian <coughs> observers, to politicians, the West's intent with respect to Ukraine. So it'd be nice to think that we could get to some sort of resolution on this issue, maybe along the lines of, you know, when I, when I have an argument with my wife, I say, you know, these arguments escalate, right? Because you start out by saying, well, you know, you did this. Well, yeah, well, I remember when two years ago you did that, da, 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 and it escalates. The point here is that maybe we can all say, look, we didn't ha handle those negotiations uh, uh, in February 21st all that elegantly. Maybe we should have stuck to the agreement, stood by it a little longer, a couple of days maybe. Uh, and uh, you, you, for your side, acknowledge that uh, the events in Crimea were done less than elegantly. And if we could both sort of acknowledge that we did something wrong, maybe we could begin to build, build rebuild, I should say, those bridges of communication which right now uh, stop uh, on the point of, no, you did everything wrong. The other side of the said, no, you did everything wrong. And it all starts at completely different junctures. We have time for one more question from back here. He, uh, he asked to address the question to me. Do I get to answer it? Of course, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a problem at all. I think the short answer to your question about Putin's strategy uh, is it's not over yet. Um, you know, what we see today is not where this is going to end up uh, down the road. It's a, it's a very dynamic process. Uh, that's one. Uh, two, uh, for all the Western interest, uh, in Ukraine at this point and for all the outrage of what the Russians have done, I haven't seen a groundswell uh, of interest anywhere in the West for actually helping Ukraine in a serious way. Uh, we know that rebuilding the economy is going to take billions of dollars spread out over a number of years. Nobody's going to step up to the plate uh, in order to provide that type of money. There isn't going to be a Marshall Plan because you can't do a Marshall Plan uh, in Ukraine. Go back and look at the Marshall Plan at the end of the Second World War, a very a specific set of circumstances uh, that play to the interest of both the United States and the European governments uh, that engaged in that uh, and provided an opportunity to isolate the Soviet Union uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, that's not where we are at this point. And do you think the, uh, the next U.S. Congress is going to do anything other than think about further sanctions against Russia and providing lethal aid to the Ukrainians, that they're going to step up to the plate and offer them $20 billion? Um, then, um, then I've got a bridge here in Brooklyn that we can sell to you. It isn't going to happen. And so what we have to face up to in the West uh, is the limits of our own willingness uh, to support Ukraine. And if we're not prepared to do that, uh, then reason would say we've got to find another solution. Uh, we haven't yet, I think, faced up to that reality and haven't been honest with ourselves as to what we're prepared to do. We're technically finished. Arturis, did you want a quick word? Okay. So I just wanted to, to add a couple of observations towards Josh's question. Hmm. So the incentives of, of Putin and his ruling circles, I think this is very interesting. And I, I see two potential explanations in line with the, the, the proposal you're making. I mean, it would be very difficult to argue that Putin did want to push Ukraine towards the West. Obviously, he did not. But let's think about the counterfactual. Suppose he doesn't do anything. Suppose Maidan happens and Ukraine is a success story and he doesn't do anything, I think he would be next in line and he knew that he would be next in line. So that choice was actually choosing between two evils, so choosing a better evil. That's one explanation. Another explanation, I think we should sort of do away with thinking of Russia or any other state for that matter as a unitary state. I mean, the Russian regime is, a, is, a, is a, as any other dictatorial regime. You have a leader and then you have clans aligned around the leader that fight for power by making their pushes in different parts of domains. So I think in this case what happened with Ukraine is a really big victory of the, of the both secret service and the military, uh, military part of the, of the Russian regime. So I mean people like, I think this to, to a large extent this is a success not of Putin but so much but success of Rogozin, so success of Igor Shoigu, the people who are actually in charge of these military decisions. I think they m improved their position inside the Putin's ruling circle by making these decisions. I might be wrong with that. I don't know the inside, but that would be one of the possible conjectures to explain what exactly happened. That is not necessarily Putin's own decision, but the decision of some people in his ruling circle that improved their political position after this event, even if the position of Russia and the position of Putin actually has not improved as a result of that. Thank you to the panelists for their expertise and uh, sharing their perspectives. Thank you all.